Welcome to the T2 Hubcast. Join T2 and guests as they discuss all things personal and professional development. The T2 Hubcast, brought to you by the People Performance People. Welcome to the T2 Hubcast with me, Spencer Locker. And me, Tracy Roberts. Excellent. <laughs> Welcome, Tracy. You're in your inaugural T2 podcast. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Good. Excellent. Enjoying your time here so far? I am. I'm loving getting to know everyone. <laughs> you could have put Interesting that Interesting characters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's all about you today. Let's make it this is. podcast all about you. Just find out a little bit more about who you are, where yeah. you're from, what makes you tick. Brilliant. So, um, firstly, tell us your story, Tracy. Okay, doke. Well, I don't really know where to start. <laughs> I, 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 I guess what I'll do is I'll start from when I was 16 and I actually knew what I wanted to do. That's All right, okay. start, isn't it? Um, yeah. So, I was, I'm from Aberdeen in Scotland, mm-hmm. um, from a seafaring city, a seafaring family, and um, decided to join the Navy when I was 16. Mm-hmm. So, I went off and did that for eight years. I was really, really lucky. I got to travel internationally, all over the place on aircraft carriers and oh. frigates. Yeah. Um, had lots of fun, got drunk quite a lot as well, I'm not going <laughs> to lie, um, but decided when I was sort of 22, 23, um, I wanted to not be Bridget Jones. I didn't want to mm. be, you know, without a family or anything. And I've seen a lot of people around me just not been able to hold that family life down. So decided to follow my second passion yeah. and go into CV Street and go into the health and fitness sector. Right. Um, so sort of went down that pathway um, and was brave and just left and just went and took a job as a coach somewhere and, and loved it. But just quickly, quickly just climbed the ladder and ended up as a, a regional manager, a general manager, a trainer, and, and got my way up to doing national and international roles. So what I did realize very quickly was they were all underpinned by the same thing, which was the whole L&D piece, you know, mm getting people through the you know a system to help them learn things and become better at what they were doing and mm. um, so everything i've ever done has always been underpinned by that right um and, and hence the reason i'm here awesome <laughs> awesome how did you find the transition between military and non-military i found it quite easy but i know a lot of people who found mm. it quite tough i think i was still young enough to kind of get my head around the fact i was you know not as institutionalized as, as some people who've maybe done 25 years mm. um and i was still a young go-getter at that point so yeah leaving um, was pretty simple and I had a lot of support um, and I was very fortunate to get in front of the right people, to get into the right jobs initially. Mm. Um, and yeah, I found that the camaraderie was quite similar from from there into another sector. So yeah. I still got the banter, which I enjoyed. And I think that's really what's carried me through that, that sector, to be honest. Excellent. Thank you very much. What about you in your personal life then? So we looked at you professionally. Yeah. What about personally? Polar opposite from oh, being at work. Right. Okay. So at work, I'm really energetic. I'm always on. Um, love being in a room with loads and loads of people. Um, when I'm at home, I'm quite quiet, actually. I like mm. a little bit of peace. I'm quite serene. So mm. I like to read a lot. I spend time with my husband and my little girl. She's 11, so she keeps me on my toes. Um, I've got a dog. I'm a dog lover. Um, yeah. So you'll always hear me talking about my dog. And still do a lot of fitnessy type stuff. So I've got a couple of co- uh, people that I still coach. Um, still do a little bit of PT and, and teach the odd class from time to time because I still get a lot of enjoyment out of that. Mm. Um, and I also do a lot of Olympic weightlifting myself. So Ooh, right, as well okay. as that, I like to cook and I sometimes like to drink wine as well. Crikey. <laughs> Where do you find the time to work? Well, that's the thing, isn't it? I don't know if I'm going to be able to fit it all in. So name check for your dog? Huxley. Huxley. And what Hux. is what? what I'm, I'm assuming that's a, a male dog? Yeah. Yeah. Um, what breed is he? He's a sprudel. So he's a Springer Spaniel mixed with a toy poodle. And he's brown and fluffy and he's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he is. Very I'm naughty sure as is. well. Yeah. Naughty pup. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good stuff. Thank you very much. Again. So back to the professional side. Yeah. Um, we, we, as we, you said then, you, you like sort of L and D. You like how to in, in, sort of develop people, how to put people in a better place. So from your perspective, what's the best lesson that you've learned? Well, we all just constantly learn, don't we, particularly mm. in this sort of side of things. But I think for me, it's about being true to yourself. I think mm. a lot of people feel that to do a certain job or, you know, to impress a certain type of business, etc., they need to sort of push themselves into a hole and, and almost, you know, behave a certain way. And I think the one thing that I've learned over the years is it's about being true to yourself. So, you know, what is your, your natural talent? You know, how do you, how do you become the best version of yourself? 
Um, and if you present yourself in that way, in the right role, then you're going to flourish. You know, you're going to be great at it. Um, but I have been in roles previously where I felt like I'm not being myself and I'm being forced a certain way. And in all honesty, I think what I always say to people is if you ever feel like you're in that position, you're probably not going to develop very well. So you need to remove yourself from that situation and put yourself in a position where you can actually be yourself mm. and really build on that constantly. Um, and I, I guess everybody gets a job like that sometimes, don't they, where they get in there and think this is great and you know everything's you know fantastic, but they don't feel like they're being themselves. Um, hmm. And that can be really exhausting. So the, the one thing I've taken is always be yourself. Yeah, uh, you're right. I mean, you've got to be authentic. You've yeah. got to be authentically you to bring the best version of you to, to work, to be productive, to be happy. Um, you can't be happy if you're not authentic. If you're trying to no. pretend to be something else, you're not going to be happy. And you're not going to be yeah. productive. So... And it's funny because learning so much about the print styles that I have been in the last week or so, yeah. it really does actually shine a light on that because, you know, you're in your shadow behavior in a situation mm. where you're not being yourself. So I think the two interlink definitely. Mm. And how, how many people, I mean, um, you're, you're, you're only in your late 20s, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in, in my experience, the amount of people I've run into aren't happy in the jobs. Yeah. The amount of people who live for the weekend. I mean, there's nothing wrong with living for the weekend. No, absolutely But I mean, uh, when yeah. it's when it's because you don't want to do the job, you're in the wrong job, you've got yeah. a bad manager, you've got... A, a, you. Well, it, yeah. Because you are, you cannot be your authentic self no. for, for one reason or another. No. Um, it's so demoralising, isn't it? I mean, we run into these people. I mean, I'm sure you do as well, day in, day out. You're not going to become a thought leader then either, are you? Because if you're if you're not doing something that a you feel yourself doing, and you're in the right environment where people are accepted of you and like that about you, then you're never going to start thinking outside the box and you know being able to develop things and add to that team because you're mm -hmm. literally just going to sit there and feel like you're stagnating. So yeah. I definitely think that's the biggest thing I've learned over the years is to just be yourself. And the right person is going to take one look at you and go, "You're fantastic. You're for us," you know, and you're mm -hmm. just going to flourish. Yeah. Excellent. So if you're your, your authentic best self, you or, 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 or and everybody else, <laughs> but yeah, yeah through, through being your authentic best self and that makes you productive and it makes you successful and yeah. all this and the other, for you in your particular situation, what is what has been your greatest achievement in your view, the best achievement? I guess there's two there's two big achievements in my life. My first is the the standard cheesy one, which is my daughter, <laughs> right, <laughs> because yeah. I love just watching her grow into a brilliant human, you mm. know, and and having you know a little bit of a a say in how that works. So that's probably my biggest. But in terms of work, I think as I've grown into myself and I've got mm. more comfortable and I've got you know bigger roles, I think the the biggest achievement in itself is being able to share my expertise nationally, internationally, and help shape big task groups and you know bring in new initiatives at businesses um so generally it's it's the scope that's my achievement i think how you know that i've been able to work in so many different environments and with different companies um but two that stand out i got to present in st lucia once that was just amazing wow. and, and it was on the beach and it was fantastic um and i think the other thing that i found was the biggest achievement one of my biggest achievements which is a little bit out of a bad situation is how I helped a business pivot during COVID, you know, All right, okay. move the entire infrastructure online and, you know, set up, um, you know, different types of partnerships with who we were working with because all of a sudden overnight the business fell through the floor and we had to think quickly. So mm. I guess professionally that probably was, was one of my biggest achievements. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds, well, I, I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you could turn around, you could say that a lot of people did that, but not many people did it successfully, did they? No, it was unfortunately. I think we've taken a lot for, from that period, haven't we? And yeah. um, it, what it does show us is what we can achieve if we mm. really have to. So Certainly, for me, yeah. it was quite a, a pivotal part of my career. I think there's there's a, a there's a little bit of thinking outside the box there, a little bit of being a little bit creative, but I also think there's a hell of a lot of trust, isn't there? Yeah. Um, when when we start thinking, I mean, not maybe not necessarily from from your perspective in the sense that um, customers cannot come into the the premises. Yeah. Uh, when we start thinking about other organisations where, um, let's say for, in, for the sake of argument, the, 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 the leaders, managers may have not been quite trusting of their people to work from home. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and because of that lack of trust or, or that potential lack of mm -hmm. trust, it never happened. 
Well, then it did. It Your did, hand yeah. was forced. And, and, and many, many people recognised and, and found out that their people were actually trustworthy and they do want to do a good job they and do. they will do it wherever. But, yeah, that's that's the last sort of 18 months. So in the interests of balance, <laughs> in the interests of balance, because we talked about your greatest successes, what about failures? What about where you haven't achieved the outcomes that you might not have wanted to? Or, or maybe it was just a mistake rather than a failure. Yeah. And, you know, what... what we, as, as I'm sure you'll 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 talk us through it. Well, I always sort of live by the mantra that if you aren't winning, you're learning. Mm. So um, what I would say is we probably need about six hours to go through all of my <laughs> <laughs> mistakes I've made in my career. So this is part one of six, is it? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> we could do a whole podcast series on this. Um, I think I think for me, it's again, it goes back to finding your own style because I yeah. think when I first came out of the forces, I would probably put this down as my biggest failure. It was trying to lead in a way which I thought was expected of me. Um, and I say, I say this openly, I think I kind of had a more dictatorial style of management when mm. I left the forces. So for that first sort of 12, 24 months, I think I wasn't a tyrant by any means, but I was a very much, let's get this done. And, you know, maybe not as empathetic as, as I could have been. Um, and I think if I look back to how I managed people then, um, I got the job done. I absolutely got the job done, um, but I could have done it a whole lot better. Mm. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding that over the years I've kind of seen poor management styles mm. and, and management styles that don't sit well with me. And it's almost like I, I had a bit of an epiphany one day and thought, well, this is not my natural self anyway. Mm. So why am I leading this way? Um, so started to be myself and bring that into my leadership mm. style and, you know, found that I got a better result as a consequence. So, you know, I wouldn't have got as far in my career if I hadn't have found that balance. So my biggest mistake probably was trying to do what I thought was expected of me and managing that way and not just be myself. So mm. I've learned from that and, and hopefully... Yeah, it's an, inter good. it's an interesting point you make. I mean, Martin, uh, Martin Johnson, not, no, not that Martin Johnson, this Martin Johnson, um, <laughs> he, he frequently says that... Um, uh, we get we get sometimes get moved into um, the position of management because we're good at one thing, so we get the job of doing something yeah. else uh, without necessarily being prepared for that or trained for that. So we're put in a position of re quite quite great responsibility mm. without much training, or has happened in the past yeah. anyway. So what is your what what influences your training uh, your your management style? Well, it's how you've been managed in the past, and if you've been managed in the past in a sort of a directive dictatorial style, then well, you know what, I haven't had any di much direction and no formal Absolutely. training, so that's what I will do, mm -hmm. even if it's not who you are. And it, it, it was awful. I mean, I think we had a, a conversation previously about where I used to be really upset, you know, mm. so I'd, I'd get the job done, mm. but I'd go home and I'd, I'd be really upset at home. And mm. my other half would say, you know, it's your job to be a manager. You aren't, you're not always going to be liked, but I sort of agree with that and sort of disagree with that at the mm. same time, because I think there's a balance. Yeah. Um, but that's definitely when I realized if I was that upset about mm. it, it wasn't natural to me. Yeah. And that's why I needed to be myself and, mm. and lead in the way that I wanted to lead. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Really interesting, and again, we talk about our unconscious motivators, yeah. and it and it's not a it's not necessarily um, a need to be liked, but it's the fairness, I suppose, and the the, the right way of doing things that Absolutely. align with your unconscious motivators. Mm. About you know what I I wouldn't how would I react if I was treated this way, and mm. and yeah, yeah, good stuff, excellent. So. Um, Moving on, or rather <laughs> not moving on, okay. moving backwards. <laughs> Let's go on a time a time journey. Let's go backwards to, to when you were 21 years old. Mm -hmm. So if you could meet, let's say for the sake of argument, you're on one of your many deployments in a in an aircraft carrier. There's not or in any a, photos in a, going in around a sort of, there. <laughs> no, oh, you thought you got away with it. Yeah. Um, so you find yourself, you, you walk into a bar in... in in the Middle East or whatever, and in this bar is your 21-year-old self. What advice now would you give that 21-year-old version of you? I'm, I'm visualizing Manila now in my head. I can remember that being a, a really, really fun uh, place to land. Oh, I would say two things. One, don't drink so much. Um, and because that's just generally part of life when you're in the Navy, we had so much fun. But we also worked really, really hard. So yeah. it was kind of yin and yang. But I would also say probably something as simple as get out of your own head. So stop overthinking everything. Stop doubting yourself. 
uh, and stop trying to fit in everyone's box. You know, you're not going to fit in everyone's box. Not everyone's going to like you, but mm. as long as you're being true to yourself, you know, you can become awesome and, and do whatever you want to do. I think at 21, even in the sort of position of authority I was and, and you know, looking after, you know, national security, if you like, yeah. I didn't really see you know, that as a, as a, an amazing thing. Now I look back, I think, wow, I did that when I was 16 to 20, you know, 22, mm. 23. Um, but I don't think I had the confidence in myself then. And I don't think that truly came into fruition until I was in my thirties, you know? Mm. Yeah. Oh, hang on a minute. We said I was only 28, didn't we? Yeah. Well, let's like stick that. with that. <laughs> do you, have to, do you don't have to give us any specific numbers. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I say yeah. till later on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. That's really, it's really interesting though, because, um, when, when we start thinking about that, so uh, if, we, we, if we follow that down that road a little bit, let's just say for the sake of argument, and I know it's a stretch of the imagination, but let's just say that your 21-year-old self did actually listen oh, to what you yeah. said. I mean, it's remote and it's probably unrealistic, but let's just say that she did. Would you still be where you are now? He, uh, probably in a similar position hmm. because... Even back then, if I think back to what I did then, mm. um, it, it was similar drivers. Yeah. So the bits that I loved about the job I did in the Navy was yeah. getting up in front of a group of people yeah. and telling them what was going on. Mm. So, um, or, you know, training people that were coming through. So I loved all those sides of things. And, mm. I, and I liked knowing what other people didn't because I worked in the intelligence department. Right. Quite so I'm inherently nosy. That, you know, so I would have ended up in some sort of role with people and development, <laughs> definitely. But I might have gone down a slightly different path because um, two, three times I was approached to go officer and have my papers raised. That's what we call it in the Navy. Right. Okay. Um, and I did start to embark on that once and then pulled out and then twice and then pulled out. And that was a self-confidence thing, but it was also peer pressure back then. You know, if you were in the, the middle ranks and you kind mm. of announced that you were going to go to the officers sort of yeah. side of things, sometimes you weren't treated very nicely about that. All you know? right, okay. Um, so I, I guess maybe if I'd had more confidence and I thought, you know, I don't care what you think. If they think that I'm good enough to do that, I'm going to do that, you know. Yeah. So I might have just taken a bit more of a wibbledy wobbledy path, but I still think I would end up in a similar position, right. you know, supporting other people and developing people for definite. Mm. Um, because that's why I get out of bed in the, the morning, really. That's my yeah. why. That's your why. Yeah. And it's interesting that you know your why. Yeah. Because a lot of people don't. And and again, it even takes us back to that being authentic, doesn't it? Yeah. 100%. I mean, so many people who, um, so many people might sort of, think they know their why because it suits what they do now but if they're not being authentic now then their why could be a little bit skewed it takes and that might be why time. they're not happy i don't i think some people genuinely don't ever find it properly they, no. because they're not steered in that path you know um and it did take me a long time to to pick it apart probably quite a few years before i realized that all the things were coming back to the same thing and mm. and it really is about um people essentially you know people are important to me and um, not just the people that are close to me other people and i love the fact that you can almost like a piece of jigsaw you can take a piece off yourself and give it to someone else and they yeah. kind of put it in it's like that final piece and they can go in you know do amazing things just because you've given them that little bit of support or that little nugget of information that might just blow their mind it might be something really simple to you and i mm. but to someone else it just gives them that confidence to go and just do something amazing mm. You know what? That's that's a really it's a lovely way of looking at it. I mean, just to, just to sort of reinforce what you're saying there, I was um, I was doing a little bit of coaching uh, the other week with a, a gentleman. I won't go into no names, no pack drill, all this that, and the other. <laughs> However, um, he did share something with me that that he sort of struggles with on a on a quite frequent basis, um, and I just. I, I'm, I've got to admit, I struggle with a similar thing, but I change my perspective a little bit, and I think a change of perspective is is really valuable, Absolutely. really valuable. So I sort of said, well, rather than focusing on it this way, why don't you have a look at it from that way? And he went dead quiet, and he went, you know what? I've never thought of it like that. That I'm, I'm using that. And he got quite animated and quite excited. Just as you said, that little jigsaw, that little piece where he goes, click, connect, complete right wow yeah i've never seen it like that before i'd always looked at it as a weakness or a, an area for development that i'd never been able to just get my get my hands hands around but now you say it like that that's a golden nugget that isn't it yeah. i've never looked at it like that or i've never thought of it like that yeah. as soon as you get that response it's like mm. yeah that the job's done there isn't it isn't it and they, that, that's not you 
giving them things and doing things for them that's you coaching them to actually find their own solution yeah. or, or to realize himself and coaching's just amazing for that isn't it you know just mm. people will find it in there you've just got to tease it out a little bit that's yeah. all and and again i think that's all part of the learning and development and i think as a as an effective practitioner of l and d or or education mm. you've got to have that open mindedness where oh yeah where where you are looking at things from different perspectives that you sort of I mean, we're human beings at the end mm -hmm. of the day, so, and we're all products of our environment, and we all see the world in a certain way, and we'll have opinions, and we'll have things where, that we'll access, and we'll say, right, well, this is this. To mm -hmm. me, this is this. But I think as, a, as an effective practitioner of L&D or education, all that, you've got to have that open-mindedness where you sort of go, well, I think this is this. What I need to do is check a couple of other perspectives and Again, you don't have to align to anything. It mm. might be, well, that actually doesn't fit my context or mm. that doesn't fit my... Yeah. So so I'm, I was right there. That For me, that is yeah. the way it is. But it's so valuable to be able to be open enough to be able to get those other perspectives and sort of go, right, okay, that challenges me. Yeah. That challenges my way of thinking. Again, it just all it does is it, it creates a train of thought because at the end of that train of thought, you might be back to where you were, Yeah. but you might not. It's opening conversations, yeah. isn't it? Ultimately, it's it's you know creating pathways for people to make up their own mind about things. And like you say, some things you're going to align with fully because that's mm. your you know deep set in your beliefs. Um, but sometimes you can have your perspective change just during a session, can't you? Because somebody else will just throw something out there, and you'll think, okay, yeah, well, it wouldn't work for me all the time. But I completely mm. see where you're going with that. Mm. So for me, with stuff like that, it's about us, about us providing the wind for the sails. Mm. You know, the ship's going to go around all over the place depending on what direction the wind's traveling, isn't it? But we're just providing that momentum for people to find, you know, to get to the destination, really. Certainly, and I think that some of the the work we do here at T two when we when we're working with uh, teams, organisations individuals um we've got a lot of content we've got a lot of theories we've got a lot mm. of um things that we we sort of position for people chuck it out there but i think the power that the, a lot of the power in it is when they take that information and go right what does this look like in my world what does this look like to me uh, and they might have to check it once or twice they might have to come back and go have i got this right yeah but it's putting it into your context owning isn't it, it? Yeah. owning it and going right okay yeah. then um, there's, there's, you can chuck one bit of advice out there and six people can take it six different ways or put it in six different contexts yeah. and go, right, this does work for me, but in a slightly different way to what it does for the other five. Mm -hmm. And it will so, depend on the, the, the sector and the type of structure that they've got in the business and yeah. all sorts, won't it? But yeah, I mean, we, we tools are there, aren't we? They're tools, essentially. Yeah. So you can unlock that locker at any point, take out anything that's just going to mm -hmm. work for that particular um project mm. or it could be just the infrastructure of the business but yeah. equally like you say making it your own i think the best businesses do take those external kind of tools but internalize them mm. you know and make them their own so you're absolutely so, right yeah i mean we work with a lot of um a lot of uh, public sector particularly fire and rescue mm -hmm. fire and rescue service and um <clears throat> we were talk, talking to some of the uh, fire and rescue guys not so long ago and there was i was saying when you turn up to a, an incident, shall we call it an incident, mm -hmm. you turn up to an incident, do you use every single bit of kit on your appliances, your trucks? No, they don't. They take and use what kit's applicable to that particular yeah. situation. Great analogy. And it's, yeah. it's right, okay. Mm. And, it, and that's what it is, isn't it, really? Yeah, 100%. Just open then that toolbox, and if you need a pair of pliers, you've got a pair of pliers mm. in there. If you need a screwdriver, flathead. Cross point, Phillips, <laughs> whatever. You just got to make sure you're ready for every eventuality in that toolbox. That's yeah. that's the sort of the whole kind of emphasis of it, isn't it? Mm. If you've got everything there ready to go, you're not going to panic. No. And and, so. I, and I quite like that. I quite like that analogy in a, in a slightly different way as well. Because for me, I've got to use the right tool for the right job mm. because of the way I am. Yeah. But I know there's people out there who will maybe not use the right tool for the right job. They'll improvise and they'll adapt. I haven't got the right tool for this, but if I take this and I and it still works, and this is yeah, the beauty of it, yeah. and this is the thing is when we when we recognise that we're all differently, yeah, yeah 100%. and it's just different. It's not better or worse or good or bad. It's mm. just different, and mm. yeah, I think that, that works a treat. That does. So, what about the future then? <laughs> what about the future? What about your future? I don't think the future um, 
in terms of my objectives is different because mm. I still want to continue to develop people and, you know, make them the best version of themselves. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's more about what I can learn now and how I can develop my skills further. So for me, joining the team here is going to give me an opportunity to work with a whole heap of sectors and, yeah. and different types of infrastructures and businesses. Um, and for me, I just continually want to develop. I'm like a sponge. So I just want to learn as much as I can and hopefully um, be part of this, you know, big journey with T2. And, you know, we're going good guns, aren't we? So, yeah. we, you know, I'm in it for the long haul. I want to be here to learn as much as I can about the people we work with and potentially the people we can work with mm. and just be better, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. I, I do. Excellent. Good stuff. So, again, we'll go for a, a bit of an emergency question. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> if, if you could describe yourself in three words, what would those three words be? I've got to use the clean ones. Um... <laughs> no, no, no. Have we got a bleep machine, Dylan? I'm sure we've got a bleep machine somewhere. I would say energetic. Okay, yeah. Passionate. Right. And caring. Okay. I've got, I've got, I wouldn't challenge any of those. The only thing I would say is you try and be energetic after you've had a slice of that cake <laughs> that you brought in this morning. I'll just be True sat- story. Ooh, true story. Yeah. You have to do some burpees later, I think. Yes. Uh, not too soon afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Good stuff. So Tracy Roberts, it's been lovely talking to you. Um, your inaugural, inaugural T2 podcast. Um, I'm the hope of, we put these on the hub, and I'm sure that you're going to be uh, involved in a hell of a lot more. Um, but uh, thank you for giving me the honour of, of steering the ship, having the helm. Is it is the helm? Yeah, yeah, yeah the helm. Good. <laughs> I'm, I'm using all my naval analogies now. <laughs> having the helm on this particular podcast. But Tracy Roberts, thank you very much indeed. You're welcome. Great seeing you. Great meeting you. Great hearing about you. Um, and that's the end of this hubcast. And we'll be back shortly with another. T2 Hubcast, thank you very much and goodbye.